meeting is now being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 101 on Canal Multiple Use presentation. Our presenter today is Jim Duncan. He is the Principal Engineering Analyst in the Water Engineering Department of Salt River Project, where he has worked for about 35 years. Um, Jim oversees SRP's Canal Multiple Use Program, which directs the development of all recreational use canal bank projects through partnerships with local municipalities. These projects include multi-use trails, public art installations, and special events. Jim has worked in all aspects of operating and maintaining the SRP canal system, as well as functions and economic development. Jim has said that anytime you have a question, please feel free to stop him and ask him any question you'd like. Just make sure that you have the microphone first. Okay, and with that, I present Jim. Now that's on. Okay, good. Okay, this is really going to test my skills because I've got to operate two things at the same time. So if I stray and here, just shout at me. And really, if you have any questions, just just ask as we go along. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. As I mentioned to a couple of people, um, this is you know not the typical group that I do presentations to. I mean, you're you're uh, really kind of the water. What, what a resource, more technical side of things. I mean, I typically, you know, have audiences of people that are more involved in, in you know, transportation planning and, and that sort of thing. But I think this is great, and specifically because there's a big educational component uh, to what we do with canal recreation and what we hope to develop it into uh, that I think directly plays into the kind of work that, that you do. So um, what um, – Okay, so we're just going to cover, um, you know, basically uh, public use of the canals and how that has to be compatible with what SRP does to maintain and operate the canal system. We're going to go through some examples. Uh, some of these you're going to be familiar with if any of you get out and use the canals uh, for recreation. We're going to talk about the Arizona Falls uh, hydro unit venue that is part of this program, um, some canal-based art events, and then a little bit about where we're going from here. Um, with use of the canals. So really, you guys know the backstory. I mean, obviously the SRP canal system was, was created to serve uh, an agricultural base, and uh, that's diminished over the years. In fact, most of the water today no longer goes for agricultural use. Most of it, upwards of 85 to 90 percent, is really being delivered to municipal water treatment plants. So uh, what does that mean? It, well, that means the area is urbanized. And so with urbanization came a, a much greater demand for use of the canals for something other than delivering water. Now, the canal system has always been open to the public, uh, the canal system meaning the canal banks. Uh, none of you are old enough to remember the days when people used to go swimming and water skiing and everything else in the canals. Um, but uh, that's frowned upon today. Um, but use of the canal banks has always been open, but it was never really formalized until the mid-60s. And that's when um, Maricopa County, the Arizona State Horsemen's Association, and, and some of the cities came together and uh, got with SRP, the Bureau of Reclamation, and created um, 
uh, an agreement that allowed for passive recreational use, meaning non-motorized, so walking, jogging, bicycling, picnics, you know, that sort of thing. At the same time, there were no improvements done on the canals. The canals were being operated and maintained just as they always had been. It was a pretty mechanically intensive operation, so there really wasn't a lot of use of the canal banks, even though that agreement was in place, and quite frankly, there were virtually no constructed improvements. Um, that along with the fact that as the areas urbanized, the canals, once very prominent in an agrarian culture here, um, really kind of became almost like alleys. I mean, development happened. Maybe some of you live in subdivisions, uh, older subdivisions that basically just turned their back to the canals. Industrial areas did the same thing. Um, and so consequently, as the area urbanized, you have thousands and thousands of people that drive over these waterways every single day, and they don't have a clue what they do. Okay? It's, it's amazing to me. I didn't grow up in Phoenix. I grew up in Tucson. But after 35 years here in the Phoenix area, it still amazes me um, how little people really know about their water and where it comes from, um, despite the fact that they live around these canals. Um, so um, urbanization took its toll. I mean, the canals that uh, once were flowing through um, <clears throat> agricultural fields um, became, you know, dumping grounds for everything from shopping carts. And we could spend a half an hour talking about all of the things, um, some of the bizarre things that we find in the canals. Um, unfortunately, um, people tend to throw everything and anything in the canals. So, you know, maintenance of the canals changed, operation of the canals changed. Uh, Quite frankly, a good part of the canal system in certain areas of town really, <clears throat> even though available to the public, really were not very um, conducive to public use. It just wasn't, wasn't a great area. Um, so I'm going to throw this term around of canal multiple use, and what do I mean by that? Well, SRP uses that phrase. Really, it's a catch-all for uh, public use of the canal system. Anything that happens on the canal system outside the SRP's core business of delivering water, so use of the banks uh, for the general public uh, to recreate on the canal banks falls into this category of canal multiple use. We had this agreement back in 1964, that agreement expired in 2014-15. At the same time, the federal regulations uh, that govern use of the canals, um, um, federal regulations, uh, now dictate that uh, recreational use of the canals is an authorized use. So you don't really need to have an agreement anymore. In 2015, um, USBR and SRP did uh, it create an agreement. It's, it, it was really more kind of symbolic because with or without the agreement, the public has the right to be on the canal banks. Um, but nevertheless, this was done to solidify the relationship between uh, the Bureau of Reclamation and SRP, uh, and, and to really send a signal to the cities that we're going to continue to be open uh, and available for them to create improvements on the canal banks. So, um, you know, fair amount of press in 2015. Um, this really, I mean, the, the agreement in 1964 was the first of its kind to formally uh, authorize use of, of the canals. Uh, and so it's, it was slow to get started. I mean, really, as I said, not much happened from the mid-60s. The first improvements really didn't happen until the mid to late 80s. Uh, and really most of what you'll see here today has happened in the last, you know, 15 to 18 years. So permitted use of the canal banks. Um, when, uh, when cities embark uh, and almost all of these projects are done uh, in partnership with the municipalities, when they first have their public meetings, as you can imagine, you know, they kind of open it up to everybody and anybody, and they all come to the meeting and they all say, yeah, we want the Grand Canal to look like the San Antonio Riverwalk. We want it to be covered. We want the banks to be covered with Starbucks and all kinds of restaurants and patios, and that doesn't work. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that the canal system continues to be um, uh, a utility corridor. It, it uh, supports not only, obviously, the delivery of water, but uh, a considerable amount of power facilities. So what is uh, allowed on the canal banks is anything that's for general public recreation, and that includes landscaping, public art, all kinds of special events, 
and um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of utility crossings, which is you know, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, obviously, that depends upon the economy. Um, in 2017, you know, SRP licensed 650 utility crossings of, of uh, irrigation facilities, both laterals and the canals. Um, so for those of you that uh, are or are not familiar with the layout of the canal system, I'm guessing most of you are, uh, but here's a map of the canal system in the upper right corner right here is the Granite Reef Diversion Dam, there's the Arizona Canal, the Grand Canal, South Canal, Eastern Consolidated, Western, and Highline Canal, New Crosscut, Old Crosscut, uh, 131 miles of canal system. Of that, um, currently about 65 miles of that is developed into what we call fully developed multi-use trail, 10-foot wide paved trail with lighting, landscaping, public art, user amenities, seating, ramadas, pet stations, uh, you name it. Uh, everything that you see highlighted in yellow um, is uh, covered already with multi-use trails. Now, you can certainly use all of the canal system. It's just that what you see highlighted there uh, has the improvements. Uh, one of the biggest improvements in the last, I'd probably say, seven or eight years has been uh, a wholesale adoption by the cities to introduce signalized pedestrian crossings uh, at canal street crossings. Ten years ago, transportation planners weren't very open to that. As you know, the canal system crosses streets at irregular angles, it's sometimes close to intersections, um, and, and, you know, the car was king. I mean, it, you know, really there was little thought given to um, alternative transportation. Today, however, um, I'm happy to say that virtually every project includes uh, hawk signals, signalized, it works just like traffic lights, uh, it stops the cars to let the pedestrians across. Uh, that has expanded use of the canals exponentially. Um, because quite frankly, some of, those, some of those intersections and streets were just so difficult to get across. People would have a very localized use of the canal, and like near their home, they'd go out and they'd be real familiar you know, with the, the canal between Southern and Baseline, but they sure weren't going to try to go across either street. Um, this map, again, you kind of see the yellow, and I'm sorry, the green doesn't show up that well, but these are projects that are uh, either in design or construction right now. The biggest being the City of Phoenix's Grand Canalscape project. Um, that covers 12 miles from Indian School and 23rd Avenue to the border with Tempe at 56th Street. It's being done in two phases. Um, this middle section is roughly phase one, There's, and the other two roughly phase two. Uh, both phases are under construction now. The whole thing should be completed uh, by next spring, uh, hopefully. Uh, and again, that's 12 miles of multi-use trail through central Phoenix. Uh, after that, they will then continue to work west out until they connect up with uh, the city of Glendale. Other projects include a uh, small project down here in Guadalupe. Uh, up here, uh, Scottsdale is working. As you can see, there's been a lot of effort in the Southeast Valley for development of these trails. So. Uh, just some statistics. As I said, there's about 65 miles already complete, another 13 miles or so in design or construction. Um, a lot of money is being spent to get this done. Okay, the average cost per mile is about $1.5 million, and that's actually ratcheting up. It's probably closer to $1.8, $1.9 million per mile. Uh, these projects take a long time to happen. From, from the time uh, the first proposal happens until uh, they're finished with construction is easily a, a couple of years, if not two to three years, because of the scope of the projects. Um, where does the funding come from? Um, uh, federal transportation funding has been the mainstay. Uh, city bond funds, public art funds. Since 2012, SRP has made funding available for these projects. Uh, and in that time, I think um, the cities have utilized somewhere in the neighborhood of about $22 million just since 2012 to build these projects. Canal bank usage, and this is, this is an important number to remember uh, because it factors into the education component. Um, so it was really difficult to capture how many people were using these, these canal trails because there's no formal entry exit point, so how do you begin to measure? 
Um, thanks in part to a study done by MAG uh, that went out and did physical counts, uh, everything from people sitting there and counting people to uh, the little tube counters that would count bicycles. Um, plus today, uh, most of the cities are using these inductive loops. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a system that's embedded in the concrete, and um, it sends real-time information to your computer. Uh, it tells you, it gives you a traffic count that can differentiate between a bicycle, a pedestrian, and a vehicle. It'll tell you which direction they're going, and so you're able to, to capture information uh, uh, based on time of day. Uh, it's very valuable to the cities, uh, but, but using those numbers in some extrapolation, we know, and that million trips per year is probably really very low. Um, so there's somewhere between a million to 1.5 million people uh, back and forth on the canals on an annual basis. So how do these projects get done? <clears throat> the cities obviously take the lead uh, in terms of the design. Uh, the hard part for them is that um, SRP has a whole list of um, criteria that they have to meet. Because obviously we have to continue to maintain and operate our canal system and the power system, uh, which is no small um, activity. Uh, some of you are probably very familiar with you know, canal lining. Almost every year we're repairing and replacing a lining, which is uh, all involves the use of heavy equipment on the banks. Routine grading, dust control, weed spray, and of course, um, our favorite activity of, of uh, herding fish. Um, if you don't already know, uh, SRP stocks the canals with an Asian grass carp, uh, the white aimer. Um, there are tens and thousands of, the, of these fish through all 131 miles, and they're extremely valuable. You buy these from a fish farm, they're trucked in, they put, get put into the canal. Uh, they're about 22 inches in length. And uh, when we dry up sections of the canal, there was a time when we used to just dry everything up. We'd just basically turn the water off, the whole canal system would go dry, and we'd do the work where we needed to and really didn't worry about anything outside of that. Can't do that anymore. Um, <clears throat> you got to move all the fish. So when um, we go through a very, fairly intensive process to work with uh, not only our internal groups, but, uh, but the municipalities and other utilities that have work to do that require a dry up. And that work typically happens when water demand is low. Uh, in uh, south of the river, that happens uh, November to December. Uh, north of the river, it happens January to February. So we have a very narrow window of opportunity with low water demand to take water treatment plants offline to be able to do this work in the canals. Um, at that same time, we have to herd the fish, and that's exactly what we do. We have guys that get in the canal, and they um, herd the fish. Um, it uh, used to just be something we did. In recent years, it's become somewhat of a spectacle, and, and I'll explain that. Um, as you can see here, uh, you know, people seem to be fascinated with, with uh, watching guys run around in the water and herd these great big fish and pick them up in nets and move them along. Um, so um, all of those things have to continue, as well as all of the, all of the uh, maintenance and operations of the power facilities. So after a city design team has, has worked their way through all of those requirements, it doesn't leave them a lot to work with. But I think, you know, for those of you that maybe have used some of these trails, I think they've been pretty creative. I think they've gotten even better. And some of the improvements that are out there I really think are pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, in general, the most important thing to SRP is uh, we need to have room on the bank to uh, operate. And um, so we require a minimum of a 20-foot clear area of anything vertical. Um, the pathway we're not terribly concerned about. We can drive on that. But, uh, of course, the, the big sticking point is everybody wants shade. So, the, you know, the first go-round, everybody, you know, the city says, okay, well, you know, we'd like to plant a 1,000 trees, and we want everything covered in shade. Well. You know, that sounds good, but it's really difficult to operate equipment, especially access power lines, um, if everything, if you're trying to work around tree canopies. Uh, so when possible, the cities have been able to introduce quite a bit of landscaping. Um, and again, I think, you know, all things considered, no, it's not, uh, it doesn't create uh, miles of shaded canal, but it creates, um, it, it creates some pretty nice areas. Um, so here's just some examples that range from pretty basic to some of the more uh, aggressive projects. Uh, the Chandler Paseo project uh, in, in Chandler is really a pretty basic, pretty basic bike project, a 10-foot wide, 
paved trail, lighting, um, pedestrian bridges, minimal landscaping. Now Chandler had a bit of an advantage in that, say, like uh, as opposed to Mesa and Phoenix, because they were out ahead of all the development. They actually came in and did this project on the consolidated canal prior to any adjacent development. So they were able to meander their path and create these pocket parks and detention basin parks. They were able to really um, integrate it, requiring uh, residential developers to provide certain setbacks. So it, it really was more of a clean palette they had to work with. The city of Phoenix, for example, in their canalscape project, you know, if you can imagine the Grand Canal, if you're familiar with the alignment of that canal, from 23rd Avenue to 56th Street, there is virtually not one undeveloped inch uh, uh, along that stretch of canal, and it's old development. Um, it's been very, very difficult for them to, to be um, real creative. So um, in the beginning, you know, most of these projects were, were pretty basic bike paths. But then the city started really um, adding uh, what I'm going to call more the, the public art element um, or user amenities. This is a project in, in Tempe in Scottsdale where they really started going to um, educational-based signage, not just directional signage. Uh, so you get, these, you get these signs that talk about where the canals came from, how they were built, what the canals mean to the Phoenix area. Um, these signs uh, were actually done by SRP. This is on the Western Canal in Tempe near the um, Tempe Water Treatment Plant. Uh, they were done to mimic a, an old irrigation gate. Um, and it's basically a you are here sign, and it tells you, okay, here's what you're looking at today, and if you'd been here 50 years or 100 years ago, this is what you would have been looking at. And the whole idea, again, is to help people understand how the area has changed uh, because water has been brought to the valley. This is uh, in Tempe, um, right at the entrance to Papago Park, uh, north of the Mill Avenue Bridge. And so Tempe went with kind of this whimsical, um, you know, some seating, brightly colored uh, seating and Ramada nodes. They did a big trailhead that uh, shows where the canal is, where the trail is, and that's, they actually transferred the topo map of the entire area and sandblasted it into the, to the concrete there. Uh, the uh, Highline Canal that runs along the base of South Mountain. Uh, this was a city of Phoenix project, and they chose on this particular project to do really less work on the trail itself. It really is a very basic uh, asphalt trail on the south bank, you know, really very simple. And instead, they really put the budget they had available into art elements uh, along the way. The idea was to provide what's needed for people to be able to safely bicycle uh, from 40th Street to 14th Street, uh, but to have all these discovery points along the way. And uh, so at each of these nodes, there's just small little discoveries that uh, uh, people can, can find that, 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 again, teach them about the canal system and, and what the Highline Canal is there for. Um, Scottsdale, um, the uh, Arizona Canal in downtown Scottsdale. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. This is an unusual site. Um, it's really uh, one quarter mile from Scottsdale Road down here uh, to Goldwater. is really unlike any other quarter mile in our canal system. Uh, we were able to be a little more liberal with what Scottsdale did in this area as there is no equipment in the canal. Um, we have no inflows, we have no outflows. We don't really have to do anything on the banks. Um, all of the power lines were placed underground. So there's a tremendous amount of utilities that you can't see. But uh, the idea here was that Scottsdale was willing to spend the money to, to basically create a venue for activities in downtown Scottsdale. This is a project that is uh, under development right now. This is the Grand Canal, uh, the, 20, um, uh, the 202 freeway. This is Priest. Uh, the canal, and, and, and this shows how much things have changed. It used to be the canal was where it was and development would come in and, you know, developers were like, ugh, okay, we got to deal with this canal, you know, what can we do? We'd rather not touch anything. We'll just turn our back to it. In this case, 
before anything else happened, before any buildings were done, uh, the developer spent money to create and um, they actually you know, changed the direction of the canal, you know, the shape and, and alignment in order to have it be a feature within their development. So uh, now there's buildings back here under development. This whole project is called the Grand, and uh, it's a mixed-use uh, office um, residential retail development that is uh, really, I mean, the thinking is instead of just kind of fitting the canal in or fitting their development around the canal, they really wanted to use the canal as a, a major feature of their uh, development. So let's talk about public art. Okay? One of those um, did you know facts. Uh, the SRP canal system supports over $11 million of commissioned public art. I mean, I do this all the time, and until I took an inventory, I didn't even realize there was that much public art. It keeps getting added little by little. Um, and, uh, you know, one day you take stock and you realize, wow, okay, I mean, uh, $11 million of commissioned uh, public art. Typically, this is integrated into these canal multiple use projects. This is um, an old pedestrian bridge that was retrofitted by Scottsdale Public Art at Scottsdale Road and Camelback Road. Um, it was just a pedestrian bridge, but what they came in and they did, they, they, uh, this is a, a local artist um, that uh, they basically made these glass walls, the canal water pumps up, dribbles back down over all of these copper pots. Um, and uh, it's really you know, very nice, although they have a little bit of maintenance, you know, problems with it in the summertime because of the moss and algae. Um, but nevertheless, it's you know, a really nice feature. Uh, a lot of times the public art is integrated into uh, infrastructure. This is one of the three artist designed pedestrian bridges uh, in Tempe over the uh, new Crosscut Canal. Um, Mary Lucking is the local artist uh, that designed this. Um, uh, this is part of the uh, Highline Canal project. This is, this is really a nice, um, Lori Lundquist is the local artist that designed this. And really what this is, it's along, you find these along the Western Canal. And they're really nothing more than wayfinding signs. So at each intersection, you're going to find these. And so if it's evening and you're jogging or riding your bicycle, you can, even though the canal meanders, you kind of see where you're going because you see that kind of neon blue light out in the distance. And the base, I'm sorry, I don't have a great photo of that, but it's a fiberglass cast base that has um, kind of a, a topography of the canal system and, again, talks about, you know, what is this? What is the Western Canal? Why is it here? What does it do? Um, and then, of course, everybody loves the Pony Express. The Pony Express, of course, you know, um, has the, this monument sits right on the canal in uh, downtown Scottsdale. And so each year when the Pony Express does their commemorative ride, it concludes um, right at the Marshall Way Bridge uh, on the Arizona Canal and attracts quite a few people. Arizona Falls. Um, I'm guessing some of you have been there. If you haven't, it's, it's worth a stop at 56th Street in Indian School. Uh, it's the only operating facility in SRP's inventory um, that the public can come and go uh, as, they, as they see fit. The generation all happens inside that building, although you can't get into the building. Uh, as you can see, um, if any of you are familiar with um, SRP-designed hydro units, I mean, God love engineers, but uh, if just left to their own devices, it wouldn't have looked like this, I can guarantee you. Um, really, SRP combining with the uh, private sector art team from the city of Phoenix really was able to produce something that was better than either party would have been able to produce on their own. Uh, and, and out of that uh, is really a venue for education. As you can see, I, mean, I personally do probably 25 or 30 tours a year at this facility. Uh, there are others at SRP. It gives us an opportunity, uh, you know, K through 12, we, you know, sustainability. There's solar panels on the roof up here. Um, you know, it gives an opportunity to talk about everything from water resources, where does your water come from, uh, solar power, all sorts of, you know, SRP's renewable portfolio, um, and just pretty much anything and everything that SRP does. Um, and it has a, a strong public art uh, feature to it. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I encourage you to look that up online if you're interested, or there's a series of signage on site. 
uh, this site was chosen because one, it used to be a, a hydro unit. It was the first hydro unit in the city of Phoenix. Um, and back in the day, before air conditioning, the um, uh, people used to come to this site and they would have picnics on the canal banks. And um, our research archives group found that they had a, an old wood dance floor over here somewhere on the south canal bank. And so those are the kinds of things that are incorporated. This floor up here is a checkerboard floor called the dance floor. These waterfalls here um, are to give people an idea of what used to be here, a natural grade break in the canal, a 20-foot drop in, in, uh, in the canal. And underneath that, obviously, is the generation of 750 kW, which is small as hydropower goes. It's about enough for annual usage of about 400 homes. Uh, but again, the point being, this is a fantastic venue um, you know, to host events and to talk to people about uh, really any aspect of water. So Arizona Falls, as it used to be back in 1945, uh, then that building that you see right there is, of course, used to sit right on that floor. Um, it was open to the public in uh, 2003 and um, took a couple of years to construct and has been actively used since then. Arizona Falls at night, I'd like to say it still looks like that. Um, City of Phoenix has struggled a bit. Uh, it's under the care of um, the arts program, which you know, doesn't have a really large Maintenance budget, um, unfortunately, some of the lighting is kind of gone by the wayside, and, and, but they're, they're doing better, and it's, it's, it's keeping it up a little bit, little bit better. So um, back to the fish herding. So here's the educational component. Um, as I mentioned to a couple of people, it's not just that, uh, you know, SRP lets people go out and recreate on the canal. I mean, we do have a vested interest. I mean, we have an obligation, but the vested interest is education. And that is, we want to capture the opportunity to help people understand where their water comes from and what it takes to manage that water and get it from watershed to end use. Um, I think you are probably very aware that most people just flat out don't understand that process. Um, so when we did a dry up that I talked about in downtown Scottsdale, once they had their Scottsdale waterfront area, the very first time we needed to dry that up, the city of Scottsdale panicked a bit, saying, oh, my gosh, you can't have a waterfront if you've got no water in the canal. And, you know, tell us again when you're going to take that water out, January to February, the height of the tourist season for Scottsdale. So they were in a panic. But Scottsdale Public Art stepped up and said, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. Now, I have to admit, our guys were, it was a little bizarre for SRP. It's not mainstream work for us. But when we went out to do the fish herding, as you saw pictures of, Scottsdale Public Art orchestrated um, stilt dancers, um, urban graffiti artists, uh, little projects for kids to decorate and make a uh, whimsical white aimer. Um, I will tell you, our, our, our maintenance guys were like, um, I'm not so sure we're good with all these people out here watching us herd fish. Then they figured out that they were kind of the stars of the show, and so then they, you know, they started hamming it up quite a bit. But the point is, is that an in, impromptu event brought several hundred people out to the canal for one morning. From that, working with Scottsdale Public Art, we've, uh, lob, um, you know, we've leveraged that into – an annual event called Canal Convergence. Canal Convergence in 2017 attracted 85,000 people to one quarter mile of the canal in four days, actually four evenings. So if you had asked me 10 years ago, what's the probability that there would be a waiting list of local, national, and international artists wanting to design artwork to put in the canal? I probably would have said pretty low. I mean, I get the whole shopping cart thing in the, in the canal. I mean, you know, we know where those come from. But that's what's happened here. So uh, Scottsdale Public Art, working with SRP, uh, we're the title sponsor. Uh, the event now occurs. It has been in February, but it's moved to November. Um, this is a great event. If you haven't been to it, you really need to go. Um, you know, it's free to the public. Uh, people can come out. As you can see, 
the stuff that goes on in the canal is unlike anything that used to. Okay, the, first, the, the first year or two, I had to go to our board to convince them, okay, Scottsdale Public Art wants to put these floating styrofoam shapes in the canal, and everybody was concerned that it could be the end of the canal system as we know it. And uh, as you can see, obviously it wasn't the end, and it's just gotten more and more sophisticated each year. Um, in 2017, I mean, some of this stuff is fantastic that the artists come up with. Um, all this stuff that you see here is programmable. So to give you an idea, these pods that are floating in the water not only change color, but you can change the color off of your iPad. Not only can you change the color off your iPad, but as this goes out onto Facebook, as people like it or they like, I like blue, I like red, I like a different pattern, that influences how these how these colors change. And then, of course, the aerial feature. These, uh, these are kites that are um, operated manually. Um, each of these things, is that's like 30 feet long and 20 feet wide. I mean, pretty amazing stuff. So what does this have to do with, you know, what is SRP's, you know, interest in this again, other than for allowing recreational use? I mean, here's what the canal looked like for a period of four days, uh, which is not your typical canal. Well, when you bring 85,000 people to the canal, what better opportunity, what better place do you have to talk to people and engage people in conversation about, again, where does your water come from? What does it take to uh, manage that water? So uh, our marketing and corporate events people, we, we staff this. This event is, um, has been four days. It's now increased to 10 days um, because of the demand. Uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity. You would be amazed, or maybe not, the people will stand there and engage in discussions. They came to see the public art. I mean, we're not so, you know, we're not we're not so blind as to think, well, people just come out to talk to SRP. No, they come out because they they want to have fun and they want to see all this. But we are nonstop engaged in talking to people about everything from canal operations to um, reforestation and the protecting of the water resources through forest management. Um, these are great opportunities to be able to continue to educate the public. So really, you know, use of the canals, special events, we have marathons, all of the stuff that's going on really comes down to uh, allowing the public to use the canals for recreation, um, but it's really based in education. So where do we go from here? Um, we're now looking at um, developing um, something that's very similar to like Google Street View but it would be Google, not done by Google, but we have our own, own technology. It would be Canal Bank View so that you'd be able to go to a website, and as you're planning your trip on the canal, you drop the little guy to the Canal Bank, and you'd have a 360 view. I mean, aside from the fact that that would be incredibly useful from an operations perspective for SRP, it would be a fantastic tool for people um, to plan their usage of the canal. Our research archives group is working to develop uh, significant historic sites, information about those sites. Uh, there's a variety of software out there that uh, if you're biking or jogging, uh, it's triggered by GPS um, that will tell you the story of different things along the canal. And so that's really where we're headed. We're headed to do better tracking on uh, the number of uh, people using the canal system, and we're uh, trying to find better ways and partnerships um, to uh, make it as educational as possible. Understanding that not everybody wants to go out there and learn. Some people just want to get from point A to point B. Um, and that's okay. But there's a lot of people um, that, that take this opportunity to learn about the canal system and, and water uh, as an educational element. To give you an idea, SRP's webpage, the number one hit, obviously, is people that access it to pay their bill. I mean, you know, that, that goes without saying. Uh, of all the things that SRP offers on, on its webpage, uh, the number two page in terms of total hits is the canal mileage web page. People that want to use the canal, they can go to it and they can say, oh, you know, I live on the new Crosscut Canal at Indian School and then I want to ride my bike down to Tempe Town Lake. How far is that? So it gives you an idea. It's like that, that thing gets, it's just, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of hits. So our goal is to make sure that um, recreation continues to be made available uh, and working with the cities, it's made available uh, in the safest of ways uh, for people, but also to enhance uh, the opportunity for people 
to learn about what the canal system means to the Phoenix area. That is SRP's kind of a quick pre, you know, overview of uh, the canal multiple use program. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, otherwise, I'm sure everybody's planning their 20 or 50 mile bike ride. Might want to wait till November. Um, but other than that, that's uh, pretty much the perspective from SRP on recreational use of the canals. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim, I, I was wondering what the uh, status of some of those projects that uh, people have been developing uh, on, uh, or talking about developing, on uh, some of the big intersections like 44th and Camelback was under discussion to create commercial corners that actually focused on the canal bank. Uh, are there any of those in the works now? Um, so those... Those projects, um, none of those projects are actively being discussed with SRP. I'm sure that from a private development perspective, they're being, they're being looked at. SRP does not enter into license agreements for use of the canal bank with private developers. And we don't allow the canal banks to be used for um, uh, private commercial use. So really the canal system becomes the linear trail. It becomes the connector. And like at the Scottsdale waterfront, it certainly, as you saw there, can certainly be enhanced, you know, with operational, um, you know, issues aside, uh, to, to some pretty fantastic levels. Okay, but um, that still that, that really requires a very strong public-private uh, relationship. And and so the development, I, I, you know, I see these things. I entertain lots of design charrettes, and I see people talk about the kind of development that they would like to do, but without, without municipal participation, there is, no, there is no opportunity for that uh, retail or private development uh, to move out onto the canal bank. I have a question about the, the new Grand Canal area you're showing that's really uh -huh. nice over there. Does that interact with the Tempe Town Lake, or does it actually share water there? I noticed that it... it no, that the, the, so the city's Grand Canal scape, or you no, know, the Grand Development, okay? The Grand Development, the one that the developer, yeah, Papago Park Center. Nice no, it is a part and separate uh, from Tempe Town Lake. There is no physical connection between the Grand Canal and Tempe Town Lake. There, there are um, trail connections, and, and actually, um, but there's no shared water. The water... Uh, SRP provides the water to Tempe Town Lake, uh, um, and this is more your area than mine. Uh, that's that's non-member land. There is no water right, so the water that's being um, provided to them, even though it's being provided through the SRP canal system, it's being wheeled to them, and then it's either uh, CAP water or new conservation storage water uh, that belongs to Tempe from uh, Roosevelt. Um, I just is there any potential to use the cal canals for non motorized transportation um, in t I'm thinking in terms of boats that are maybe human propelled like a water taxi or that kind of thing you know um, probably not we've looked at that um, we did a serious evaluation in the Scottsdale waterfront that's where I was even kind of even going so far as as uh, doing designs of locks that would allow um, side channels for boats to operate uh, throughout the area. The fact of the matter is, is that um, the canal system and the street system is already, you know, so so developed that the clearance under bridges just isn't there. So the infrastructure cost would be astronomical to retrofit bridges to allow boats to get underneath it. Um, we uh, and, and then there's the, the liability issue. Um, uh, so far, um, everybody seems to be content to leave the development and, and use on the canal banks, with the exception of the public art type things that can be placed in the canal. Um, uh, but no, there's no there's there's no real serious discussion right now of, of boating.
So my question is, do you ever foresee a time where there's going to be an alternative method of transportation using the canal system instead of just, you know, vehicles the whole time or, or I think that's how we get around in Phoenix? Well, you know, um, there have been uh, concepts looked at um, of, uh, uh, I mean, very preliminary about the idea of, of doing some kind of something suspended over the canal. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the canal system, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, the idea of, of non-motorized, I mean, you know, bicycle, pedestrian, but um, nothing motorized. And then if, if what you're talking about is, you know, like a, some kind of a light rail or something integrated into the canal, is that is that what you're referring to? Or I'm thinking more of... Uh... If I want to bike and avoid all these cars or something, instead of going through intersections, I can do that with some of the different lines, but it seems like most of the canals don't really connect all the way through in some areas. Well, obviously the canal system, I mean, aside from the 131 miles, I mean, I think there's two, two, two answers to your question. One, I think uh, either with underpasses and the signalized crossings, the issue of being able to use the canals for commuting on a bicycle has, has gotten a lot better. Um, now, much like, much like light rail, it's like, well, is light rail valuable to you? Well, only if you work or live along the light rail line. So the canals are where they are. Um, the, um, you know, so if you, if you live in central Phoenix and you work in Tempe, then I would say, yeah, there's, you know, with the completion of the City of Phoenix project and the Grand project, you would be able to, you know, live in anywhere along the Central Corridor and hop onto the Grand Canal and, and easily bike into downtown Tempe. Uh, you know, uh, the new Crosscut Canal connects downtown Scottsdale to downtown Tempe. But again, it's, it, you know, it, it's tied obviously to, to um, where the canal system is. Now, I will say the canal system is, is completely integrated with all the rest of the bike trails. Most of those for the municipalities, though, are street-based. So if you're trying to avoid, you know, getting out in a bike lane, um, then obviously there's some constraints there. But, yeah, that, it, I mean, it obviously has geographic limitations. Any other questions? Looks good. I appreciate your time and uh, enjoyed talking with you.